we're starting to reach critical mass, uh, so we can get started. Uh, well, um, what can I say? What a day. It's been uh, a fascinating morning uh, with facts, figures, um, and, and some analysis. Uh, and I think the last panel uh, started to really look at the regulatory issues um, in some detail. I'm just going to check uh, timing wise. Uh, are we okay to run to 5.30? Yeah? Mm, so then we have a good, good hour and some to, uh, to solve everything that we've uh, identified as an issue. Um, this is supposed to be a, a discussing session rather than a, a presentation one. We'll have quick introductory remarks from, from our panelists. Um, Bob and Robert, who's kind of uh, said everything he wanted to say in the previous panel. Um, and then we'll have a discussion. I hope you have pent up questions uh, from the, the course of the day, since we haven't had that much time for Q&A uh, in the previous panels. So uh, please do get engaged. I'm going to be scanning the room for, for hands. Um, and, uh, and we can uh, see where, where the discussion takes us. Um, without further ado, um, I'm going to start off with John uh, Marvi, uh, the head of PPS, and uh, incoming fair chair as of next month. Weeks. Um, and then we'll have Lisa the Felix Antonio from uh, Hasbro, and then we'll have uh, Joaquin House who's replacing uh, uh, for uh, so We'll start with uh, Yara. Do you want to start? Give us some some remarks. Good afternoon. Everybody here? I tried to convince my dear friend Robert that we should have a, a vibrant dialogue this time. Um, I got to kick off. As, as you said, I'm, I'm the incoming chair of Berwick next year, which means that I'm not the Berwick chair this year. The reason I thought that for once uh, we'll be a little bit more open and try to be um, provocative, just to make sure that we go to discussion. What do you think about that? So don't, is that okay? Don't say all the things I'm saying as official Berwick's opinions. Uh, from 28 countries, see them more as reflections and um, to start off the discussion. Would you like that? Yes. This is the last panel, isn't it? Um, and maybe I won't get elected after this one. There is a lot of discussions about today of the status of Europe. And a lot of people have debated and talked about this over the last couple of months. Where is Europe when it comes to telecommunication and how do we end up here? And we see a lot, we hear a lot of examples of companies that's been there and gone there, and it's all because of bad regulation. Um, regulator seems to be in the midst of everything, and everything we do is wrong, um, basically. I claim something else. Yes, Europe has some problems. Europe missed something. We missed a small thing called the internet. That was really happened. Look on the companies that were successful 15 to 20 years ago and see where they are today. They don't work because they stopped developing something called the internet. They stayed on and thought that the old world telecommunication business model will survive. And I can name some of the companies, like for instance Nokia. When the iPhone came around, people used to have access to internet rather than making telephone calls, which was a new thing. Um, when other technologies came around, there was really the thing. When the US, this thing called the internet, was an immediate hit because of new business models that arrived all the time. And business venture, venture capitalists in other words, saw this opportunity and really grow companies that really meant something in the internal world. When it comes to like Cisco, uh, the very early on went out and said that IP is going to rule the world and started developing products for that. So the first thing I would say is that Europe, yes, we have some problems and we have to really re regain what we can do when it comes to this new business model. We have to understand that interest is in the room. The other thing that is often talked about is the fact that operators lose their revenue. Yeah. It's very, very it's, it's a dramatic thing, of course, but it's very natural for two reasons. One of them is, if you look at the old monopolies, um, in, the way, in their wisdom, the politicians decided, let's have competition. And one of the effects of competition, besides the fact that it's often better services for end users, is actually lowering prices. And often when you look at the old world incumbents uh, from many countries, you can see that they're actually losing revenue and market share. A part of that reason is very simple. It's because of competition. We didn't have competition 15, 20 years ago. It's been raised over the last couple of years. 
There's another thing on that. We did a study that came out just last week in Sweden where we now see that data stands for about 30% of the mobile revenues. 30%. Five years ago, this was close to zero. The thing with data, and people talks about the amount of data that goes through the mobile networks increases all the time. You, an operator today gets one tenth per bit in data compared to say <coughs> the same bit for voice or text, even more for text. So the fact that the total amount of minutes goes down if you combine fixed and mobile, and the operator gets one tenth of what he got before, shows that the operator should have less revenue. That's very natural. Competition and technology advancements. Because there is a new business model that we have to understand. That today, users is not using their telephones or devices to actually make telephone calls. They use it to search the internet. And here's one of the fun things. In Sweden, I have about 180 fiber owners. Yes, 180 fiber owners. The local, local municipalities, a lot of other local companies invest in fiber. And a lot of people claim that it's because Swedish people are very stupid. We like speed and we like to add on to new technologies. There is a big demand for that kind of high speed in Sweden. That's true. We are stupid and we buy that capacity. The thing is that the operators, all those local operators, makes money. The vast majority of them actually makes money by providing either black fiber or just the actual equipment on top of the fiber. It's a very viable business and the investment goes up because of the customer demand. The funny thing with that, it changes another thing as well. Size doesn't matter. Because a small and local municipality owned uh, fiber owner in Umeå in Sweden with a revenue less than 5 million euros could provide exactly the same service as one of the biggest operators in Europe. Access to internet. Which means that because you don't buy it Provided it for a product, you buy it for an access to a service, and they can provide the same services in the small municipality as a big operator in Europe. And I think that is also shown in the business landscape. So, is everybody, everything out for the big operators? No. There's a lot of business potential for the operators in the future as well. There's a lot of them, because the operators have something, some things that no one else actually can provide. The first of them is quality. I think that going along, to go, to go along as I have to say, quality is going to be more and more important, especially if we're moving to new service territories, which is not only Facebook or Google, it's actually going down to education, hospitals, and, and anything that has to have quality. <coughs> the only one who can provide that business opportunity or that thing to the end users, including a lot of security, is the operators. And I think that's very, very important. The other thing is speed. That the access and the speed is very, very important for end users to increase all the time. And operators definitely have a business opportunity for that, together with a simple product of mobility, which is also going to be more and more important. Everybody talks about the fact that all equipment that has that going to be or can have gain on the fact to be connected wireless will be that in the future. We as a regular have a big task when it comes to spectrum development in that. But that's something the operators can do as well. And I find myself with, you know, I'm trying to be a little bit aggressive in this one, but there is something that a lot of people don't realize, which I think that we also as regulators have to face. That there is a symbiotic relationship between all the top players and the ordinary operators. No, one of them won't exist without the other one. And I think there is a little room for improvement when it comes to those relationships. But they also have to work together to understand that. Because I won't buy an internet access if I don't get services on top of it. And there will be no other top players if there were no operators. That was my initial remark. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kira. Um, short, sweet, and I think uh, rather provocative to many people in the room, uh, which is great. Start to the, to the discussion. Um, we're going to move on to, to Lisa um, for a short introductory remark as well. I think it's an uh, opportunity for a short uh, initial remark to, to actually thank the Hungarian uh, regulator for inviting me today. I think this is a very, very crucial uh, time for the telecom industry and uh, um, it's really important for an alternative operator to, to have the, I mean, as many opportunities 
as possible to uh, to talk to, especially to a I mean, such a qualified audience. I'll be telling a very different story from what you've heard today, uh, very likely. Because, uh, I mean, I uh, believe that, uh, the, the, again, there are a lot of misconceptions on how innovation happens and how you can actually trigger investment in a telecom industry. I'm actually, I mean, what Mr. Marby just said, I mean, it's actually music to my ears. I mean, it's really, I mean, uh, I really believe that, that what he said, I mean, is, is extremely, uh, is more close to reality to what we've uh, heard in different occasions, either today or in, uh, in, other, uh, in other events. Let me be very specific. I don't know if you're familiar with Pastor, but I'll be very, very short in giving you uh, uh, the, the uh, brief introduction. Fasto is the, one of the major alternative operators in Italy. And Fastweb is an operator that has always taken risks, has always invested, has always had, I mean, uh, innovation at its core. We were the first in 2000 in rolling out an NGA network. The word NGA didn't even exist at the time. We just decided, I mean, our uh, founder, I mean, he's a visionary man, uh, he decided to roll out fiber to the home. I mean, there were a lot of, I mean, uh, uh, there the were the right conditions. I mean, it was a, a different, uh, let's say, continent at the time. There were, I mean, a lot of money going around. So, but, but the fact that he used to actually deploy FTTH to two million households gives you the idea of what is the, I mean, the DNA of a, a, a alternative operator like Pasta. Well, then we moved on. We decided, okay, how do we compete in other part of the country where we do not have a popular network? And we decided, we had no doubt whatsoever, that the only issue, the only tool with which, with which we decided to compete was uh, a bundling. Because we believed that having a hand-to-hand -hand control over the network, competing on quality, uh, just like what I mean, now is, Marvel was, uh, uh, suggested before, is crucial because in order to innovate. And that, that was indeed what happened. We were the first operator to launch 10 megabit service and then 20 megabit service before the incumbent. On the same local loop, I mean, we drove Tele Italia crazy, believe me. They were totally nuts because we, I mean, if it was for them, if we were just, we would be still on 600K per minute. I mean, they were so happy with that, obviously. I mean, who needs more? What do you want to do, teleport? I mean, I was like, yeah, I mean, we want to, do more than that. We launch IPTV service. Everybody said, no, you cannot do IPTV on, on copper. I said, yes, we can. And we made it. And then we now launch, we're the first alternative operator to launch a massive rollout of fiber to the cabinet. Everybody keeps saying, oh, no, it's not sustainable for a, an alternative operator. The economics is not there. I said, no, we said there is. I mean, it's sustainable. Uh, 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 obviously, we are leveraging, we have an advantage compared to many other operators because we are leveraging on an extensive uh, fiber network in many cities. But we are, I mean, again, putting innovation at the core. And innovation, but this is why, I mean, uh, the innovation happens when you have uh, a specific environment. What, what I was a bit surprised today, and what, I mean, and the reason why I was bit surprised to uh, when I first read the uh, the Commission proposal on the connected continent is that there is instead this misconception that ooh, there's too much competition we need consolidation we need to boost profitability of well of a specific kind of operators in order to create the condition to uh, invest I I'm, I'm afraid I couldn't disagree more it's not by artificially increasing the revenues of a category of operators that you're going to uh, trigger a race to fiber, that you're going to trigger innovation. Have you ever seen innovation happening where monopolies? Never, ever. I mean, uh, the only in, I mean, the only the innovation happens when I mean, a company is actually navigating the open sea when it's either desperate or it's either or it wants to increase uh, their their revenues or just wants to actually uh, do something different uh, to uh, survive or do better in the market. So you need to to, to to be there. And 
I'm so surprised that we even having this conversation sometimes because anger rates. So most of the uh, people in this room were created under one basic assumption that competition was the perfect market structure, and by leading to competition, it was a win-win situation for all, for consumers, for companies, and so for the uh, productive, let's say, for the uh, economic system altogether. I'm an industrial economist, so I mean, this is what I was told at university a long time ago. Maybe something has changed in the meanwhile. I'm not totally up to date with the new economic uh, uh, I mean, uh, ways, and so I, I, I'm very happy to learn if I'm wrong. But I don't see how instead reducing competition may lead to some, uh, some actually some uh, innovation and, and uh, increase the incentive to invest. Is that not a more couple of minutes or, or do you want me to do a minute and a half? Wow, it's tough. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me tell you the, a story of what happened instead when in Italy the regulation boosted artificially the, uh, the revenues of the incumbents. The incumbent had initially a plan in 2009 to cover, uh, I don't remember the figures, uh, but I mean a few million households with fiber to the home. Price come, and we said, okay, I have this plan, so you have to actually allow me uh, to have more, an extra revenue so I can actually deliver this. The price of unbundling went up. Price of the, I mean, a number of households in the 2010 plan went down and said, okay, we are, uh, we are in big trouble, so I mean, you have to actually help us a little bit more. So the price of unbundling went a little bit up again the, the, uh, the year after. In 2011, the planned number of households that were supposed to be connected to a fiber to the home went down again. And in 2011, actually, the plan was scrapped altogether. No more fiber to the home. There was something that was totally disappeared from their plan. On the other hand, something else happened that I think I've, I'm running out of my time, so I'll tell you the second part of the story later. <laughs> Wow, that's, uh, that's some, some tough regulations over there. <laughs> um, we'll move on to another, another uh, small tent of operator uh, in a number of markets in Europe. Um, now, joking aside, uh, Joaquin, do you want to give us a few of your remarks? Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, um, colleagues, friends, uh, thanks very much for inviting us. And um, yesterday at lunchtime, I didn't know that I would be able like, to take the opportunity to talk to you and discuss with you. Um, and I'm substituting my colleague, uh, Roland Olin, uh, unfortunately couldn't make it. So, um, uh, what I've seen um, from the discussion this morning, and uh, we've discussed a lot of diverse um, elements, and um, I'm unfortunately unable to comment on the Swedish and um, Italian uh, situation due to the fact that I'm responsible for our Central and Eastern European uh, national companies, and uh, Sweden and Italy are part of it. So, um, in this respect, uh, I heard what uh, Warren said with regards, um, uh, Warren said with regards to his provocative uh, issues and uh, also the symbiotic relationship between OTTs and operators, if I understood it correctly. Um, but coming back to um, the overall discussion uh, which we had this morning and um, our panel today, the way forward can regulation help? Um, I think we all have a common understanding that ICT is one of the key issues in the 21st century. Anything with regard to productivity, competitiveness, is uh, bound to um, ICT development for an industrialized nation. And um, I don't want to go into these aspects, what is the status of the uh, telco industry in, in Europe. Um, I think uh, we are all aware that there is an issue and um, that uh, Europe is, is falling behind with regard to investment. I'm not going to mention any of the numbers which you have already heard. Uh, this morning, and also what we've discussed with regard to the biggest challenge that we have to convince the investors that it's worthwhile investing based on adequate insurance and investment. And that's what we are lacking. We are lacking the investment we need for the future, let's say, a development of our industry. And in this respect, um, uh, we very much appreciate the effort of the European Commission um, with this um, telecom single market package. And it's um, from the, from the start, uh, step into the right direction. And we understand that uh, Vice President Cruz 
understands the need for change, less regulation, less fragmentation, more consolidation, and um, last but not least, more investment in broadband. And Deutsche Telekom, in this respect, is convinced um, that we are uh, open to discuss all these issues with the Commission, with Barrett, to come to a joint approach uh, which in the end uh, helps to find solution for the pending problems. And um, uh, of course we are not happy uh, with all the issues um, and uh, many of the things have been discussed uh, 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 during the day, but um, I think it's the right, uh, right time to tackle this issue and as uh, Robert also said, um, uh, we tend to disagree, but um, it's the start of the discussion which in the end might um, lead uh, to, a, uh, to a solution. Uh, I don't want to go into all the issues, um, why is uh, your doing so badly, it's gratification, it's from our point of view, the asymmetry in the OTTs, and that's what we, I suppose, will discuss um, on this panel. It's uh, some uh, regulatory dogmas which, uh, from our point of view, were wrong, like the letter of investment, some of them are outdated, um, it's no use to uh, stick to uh, copper regulation in light of the pending uh, investment needs on fiber. And um, if uh, you now ask me, and I want to be really short, uh, what are the most important steps needed? It's, uh, from our point of view, deregulation, asymmet uh, abolish asymmetric um, sector-specific SP regulation. It's to align the industrial policy goals with the dominance control uh, policies. It's, and uh, one of the most important things, and Robert um, addressed this in the, the panel before, it's a level playing in the OTTs. And I'm not asking, um, for regulation uh, of OTTs. The only thing I ask for is if we both <coughs> are uh, active in the same ecosystem, that we find the same framework we have to uh, correspond to. And that means that um, uh, not a heavy handed regulation is put on uh, the company operates while the others um, can um, actually do what they want. And I think there we have to find um, a balance and a fair treatment uh, so that. Also in this respect, uh, we will see how fair compensation for the usage of our networks of our OTTs will look like. And um, it's this what, what's, what has been gone wrong uh, in this respect, is the bargaining power. If on the one hand side um, an industry is heavily regulated, the others um, competing in the same ecosystem are not regulated, then of course there is a, a shift in bargaining power and that's what we see uh, with regard to the market capitalization of these OTT players which have uh, been tenfolded in the last, um, let's say, seven years whereas the um, income or the, the of mo uh, mobile and fixed operators have declined in Europe all, all, all the same. Okay, and the last um, very important issue is spectrum and there I totally agree with the Commission the approach they are trying uh, to take with regard to harmonization and of course um, taking other steps which are very beneficial for the industry to really have a deep step forward because what we have to get here is more investment into mobile networks and uh, unfortunately we have to tell member states that it's not about state budgets here it's about a framework for investment which then we can drive development. So this very uh, brief, um, I have prepared something longer, some slides but I, I think um, we're ready here to discuss with you and um, looking forward to it. Wonderful, wonderful and, and to the point. Uh, I think that, that sets to see nicely where people are coming from and, and what kind of um, points of view we have on the table. Um, we, before we get the discussion started, I, I want to just clear up something with, with Robert Lambert, which is there's this kind of, um, we're talking a lot about euphemisms in euphemistic terms about um, all this and, and high level principles. Are you, in your term as Director of General, going to launch a review of the telephone screen? If you tell me how long my term is, I'll tell you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope you will be able to tell me that. Um, okay, well, that's a good try anyway. <laughs> um, no, on a, on a related point though, I mean, one thing um, that struck me from the, the discussions this morning was that everyone seems to think that there is a problem, at least for your, your excuse, but um, that it, at least in the morning's presentations, there is an issue, we need to address it, there were uh, as many opinions of how to address it as there were presentations, I think, but one common theme was we need stability for investments to happen, we need to know what's coming so we can know what kind of um, returns we make, etc. Then the solution to do that is to change everything. Um, which strikes me as, as kind of odd. 
Um, which brings me to the point of back to the to the framework. Um, and maybe Robert, you can kick us off on this. The, the aim of the framework was to to regulate essentially. I mean, it was to in, infuse competition to the point when competition would take over, at least on the market regulation side. Um, and I've been following what the commission's been doing with Article Seven, and every attempt at deregulation uh, fails when it reaches the commission. Uh, that I've seen recently. Um, is I mean, aside from the, the achievements that the framework has, has made in the, in the past decade or so, is it um, not going to achieve what it's set out to do in terms of moving uh, market regulation over to competition? So, firstly, let me give a slightly clearer answer to the, to the first question because it, it relates to both. I, I have the impression that one of the one of the few things that the world doesn't understand, the European decision-making processes do not understand, is that we live in a world of complex systems. And we are bedeviled by having oversimplified debates like today, say, take a sector, look at a subset of the framing conditions, fiddle with them and see if it produces the answer. In a complex system, every signal produces unpredictable, un literally unpredictable responses. Therefore, you need to move in a much more cautious, iterative, uh, exploratory way. As Deng Xiaoping used to say, you have to cross the river while feeling under the water for the stones. And well, that's not just a, a, it's the second Chinese proverb uh, of the afternoon, but it's not just a Chinese proverb. It's actually a model of decision making that we have not yet internally. And therefore, my instinctive answer to your first question in the last three years has been no. We don't have sufficient clarity that intervention X in changing or reviewing the third framework will achieve real benefits out there, so let's not change some. Of course, you know, all of us who live by lovingly tending the machine want to take the machine to pieces, clean and oil it, and build another machine. So, of course, there's a certain desire also from the legislators to have a fourth after a third review. Uh, personally, I think we better be sure that we know what the positive uh, benefits would be before devoting a lot of resources to that. On, the, on, on your second point, I think the answer is therefore the same, as I said in my earlier remarks. We are not making a claim that this is a panacea. We are not making a claim that somehow we alone in the whole world know what's going we're saying that the issues on which the connected continent package constitutes a nudge are issues which need nudging. So um, I'm more confident defending a partial intervention than I would be making the case for a wholesale uh, rebuilding of the system. And, and then I think that goes to the point which, which has been made, is, is, is this an ecosystem? An ecosystem, I mean, symbiosis is when you don't eat the other thing because it's good for an ecosystem is you might be eating the other thing if you can catch it, but it's still good for the world that both things exist. I think this is an ecosystem. The degree of symbiosis is limited. And we need to look at the ecosystem as being, to, to borrow a phrase from, from a rather clever analysts, it, the consumer internet economy. In other words, data as a driver of economics and business models dissolves all the frontiers which currently frame our laws. And so you, you're not going to be able to define a winning strategy if you sit within the sectors, even if you say, I'm going to hop over these barriers and work in two sectors at once. That's still not a future group business model. And therefore, when we look at something like the OTT versus telco challenge, we're actually looking at people exploring future business models from old-fashioned labeled positions. And the ones who are thinking fastest don't care about fixing the regulatory framework. They're, they're, they're washing fluidly around these obstacles and making them. And I think that the, the key challenge, therefore, and that's why it's very nice to be sitting next to this, is innovation-led. The innovation-led solutions in this sphere will happen, partly because, as Lauren says, uh, small can be beautiful in some areas of the fiber economy, but not in all. 
And if there's a, an issue where the old-fashioned SMP and communications may come back into the picture, data is scalable. If somebody else has a, a solid hold on the big data, you know who I'm talking about, then they also own your consumer behavior. And so if it's a consumer internet economy, the people who own that knowledge will own us, or will own the opportunities to offer us compelling um, commercial packages. So I think that the issue we need to look at going forward is the, is the framing of the use of data, whether it's public data, personal data, uh, out there. And, and the rest we should be accommodating. The, the one thing I think we then have to be, uh, as a real regulator, intransigent about is the protection of the clients. And I think net neutrality and consumer protection are areas that, where, if anything, I think we need to do more. And I would hope that the larger operators would see that not as a business cost, but as a guarantee of a sustainable business future. Because if you said, let innovation lead the market, but we will ensure B2B, B2C fairness, I think we have a, a, a fairly robust uh, deal in which Europe will then win. Thanks, Robert. Um, lucid remarks as, as always. <laughs> Um, I, I want to, uh, we all talked about the OTT versus um, ISP or um, operator challenge. Um, and one thing that you said uh, in answer which was quite, oh, yeah, sorry, um, which was quite interesting was you said, you, OTTs use your network, and therefore there should be a conversation. And what your answer said was that operators sell internet access to consumers, which seems to be kind of coming at the issue from, from a slightly different point of view. I mean, uh, I guess it's for for Yaron. Do you think that um, the point from from which I've come that OTTs are using the network operators is is a valid starting point for analysis? First, I would like to say that Robert, you're wrong. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's of course a symbiotic relationship because the reason I buy internet access to get services, so that's why I do it. But I will not come back to the. I'm, I'm going to continue to be slightly provocative, if that's okay with you, just to wake you up. Um, this is a question about the, the level of playing field, it's always something that, that I've come across to me as slightly interesting. Uh, first of all, the reason why we regulate operators is because they can create monopolies for both clients. In the end, the one who owns the customer is the one who controls the access. And there's risk potential um, to, to monopolize that. Um, we've seen that, and that's why we regulate it. We don't regulate really for anyone else to make sure that the fact that the customers has a, a choice between the access. And we all know um, that, that that's going to be different in the future with technology, but that's really it. We create competition in an area where there's no really natural uh, environment for competition, which doesn't really happen on, 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 on top of the OTT players. Um, and the other thing is that I think that a lot of people don't see the business risk to it. I was in Silicon Valley together with Barry a couple of weeks ago, and I spoke to one of the we spoke to one of the biggest investors in, in venture capitals in Silicon Valley. They had about, I think about $30 billion or something they invest. And I asked him, what would you do if you could do whatever you want with that money? And he said, I would buy fiber. <laughs> he was uh, the only thing, because in the end, you want, if, if you have a fiber connection to a house and someone lives there in that house, someone's going to buy that. It's a very simple business proposition. But you won't have the 30, 40% margin that many operators are used to having from their results. It will be a lower margin. Uh, fairly in a very secure business. So it's a different business model in the end. But it's different. It's not a value exchange proposition, it's actually connecting the house to it. So basically what we can see in this discussion, and to be honest, I agree with the fact that there should be discussions between, because there are things that the operators can provide the the top players with, in terms of quality and, and stuff like that, which would be essential for all the top players in the future. But I disagree with the fact, if you look on the business view from that angle though, uh, if one of those big data mining companies today will be very, very hated by their own customers, uh, what would happen is that you would stop using it immediately. If one of those social networks came out with it and, and their reputation would disappear, you could actually freely choose not to use it. So the business risk for those big social companies is fairly big because they have to build on a very good reputation. On the other hand, if, if your operator who connects your house does something strange, you don't immediately have the ability to actually change that to another operator. 
and often there is no one operating you can connect to anyone, so the business is the road. So there are two things I want to talk about in level playing field. The, the potential for building monopoly, which is one of them, and the other one is the business is running the business. Right now it seems like the operators has, has lost the opportunity to create a lot of revenues. I say it's very natural when you go down in a value shape uh, and not providing services in the that you actually get less money out of everything. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Jaron. Um, we, we love that one, didn't we? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give Robert some extra play on the, on the wrong uh, part in a bit. But first, I want to, to address, you know, let everyone address this point. Uh, Lisa, first, I'll let you finish your. Um, the point that you you had built story, yes. Uh, but then if you could also, I mean, how does Passport look at itself in this context, in terms of the relationship with OTTs in, in this role? What, what is the business of Passport? Um. Okay, well, let's say that we believe in, uh, in fiber. I don't, I never bought this story of the downpipe being, I mean, such a bad business. I, I mean, our experience is that uh, if they build it, uh, if you build it, they will come. We are building a quality network, and we are already experiencing uh, willingness by uh, customers to actually pay more, to have more, to have more quality. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's low, it's not immediate, it's not going to change our economics, uh, but it's happening. So I mean, I uh, believe. I mean, I'm more on, um, let's say, this side of the table than the other one. Although I should naturally belong on that one. Uh, point is that uh, people want to actually navigate the the, 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 the web, access uh, Google and all other, I mean, uh, uh, incredible services that are uh, available, and they want a good, good quality, a reliable uh, network. What we're doing right now is basically migrating seamlessly all our customers to fiber to the continent. We are giving them a, a better quality, still not giving them the biggest, uh, uh, you know, the, the highest speed they could achieve, because obviously uh, our, our plan is based on the fact that they will, we give them a little bit more and they will get hungrier and ask for more. And this is happening. I mean, it's not the five years more that is scaring people away, actually. It's, uh, uh, I mean, this is a, 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 let's say, this is a, a, a very uh, mature market in which we just don't do nothing else but steal a uh, customer from each other. And what we've learned is that we have to make our customer happy. And so this is what we are focusing on. Obviously, I mean, uh, establishing a, a uh, uh, level playing fields uh, in which, for, for, for one thing, I would like uh, to see over the top companies paying taxes <laughs> like, except, like I do, or not being able to do fiscal shopping and uh, establish themselves in uh, one country or another. This is something I mean, I think it's, uh, it's fair. But if, uh, I mean, uh, uh, level playing field is called for, I want the regulation so that I can actually charge the over the top to uh, I mean uh, uh, be uh, uh, to to deliver uh, content over my network. Mm, I'm not so much on this one. I don't think that uh, uh, regulation should uh, uh, is meant to, to protect this kind of uh, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, on your can, if I if I can pick up on your other question, uh, the one before, should we be going towards a uh, uh, correct <coughs> regulation? Of course. That was the core of the original, uh, uh, the, 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 the existing framework. Point is that we're not there yet. We're not there yet for one, at least for the access services. Uh, we're not there yet for a single reason that in most most European countries, uh, the paradigm for rolling out NGA is fiber to the cabinet. This means that for a long time. I mean, not forever, but still for a long time, NGAs will incorporate, will integrate a part of the copper network. 
corporate network is not replicable. So if it's if the if you're, you're not as good as asking incumbent to replicate it, why is somebody expecting uh, uh, an alternative operator with lower economies of scale to replicate? It's obvious that in order to maintain uh, infrastructure-based competition and the incentive to invest for all, we need a sound uh, access regulation that make sure that we all can have uh, equal access to the uh, copper subloop and the unbundling, because in some region, obviously, unbundling will still be relevant for many, many years. And, I mean, weakening that is not the answer. I don't see the US as the reference market. I mean, I, I know that, I mean, there's a lot of figure going out on how the US is doing so much better than we are doing. I'm not so sure that duopoly is actually delivering great benefit for consumers and industry. I've got some figure, but uh, again, I'm not going to bore you with, with that. I mean, but I'll, I'll tell you something. The EBITDA, and again, I'm an old style economist, so for me, EBITDA is the only thing that tells you whether a company is profitable or not, you know, together with cash flow, of course. And the EBITDA of telecom operators in Europe is way higher than the EBITDA of uh, operators, telecom operators in the US. So, I mean, I don't see where this, uh, I mean, where is this the problem? Why, I mean, we are so doing, doing so badly. Alternative operator, unfortunately, is a different story, but um, again, uh, I'm not going to complain. Uh, this is not the right place to complain. To finish the story I was telling you before. So I say, boosting, artificially increasing uh, the, the revenues of the incumbent is not going to lead us anywhere. And again, the story I was telling you before is proving it too. But what happened then in Italy? In 2011, we started uh, thinking about uh, the, rolling out this fiber to the copy network. Again, everything was saying, no, it's impossible, no, it's not sustainable. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do this? We, I mean, decided that we could make it, actually. We delivered some inno innovative solution, again, innovation. So we decided that instead of spending two years negotiating access to cabinets with Telecom Italia, we were building our own cabinet next to Telecom Italia. We didn't have permission from the local municipality, no problem. We decided to have underground cabinets. They're beautiful. They go up and down. Wow, I mean, it's something very exciting. I mean, really, I mean, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, if you want to come to Italy and visit us, I'm going to show you around and, and show you uh, how they work. But point is that then we went to Telecom Italia because we never uh, I had access to subloop before. And Telecom Italia thought that we were gambling. They thought, no, you're never going to do this. But then we showed them that we actually were already building the cabinets. And this gave them the biggest shock of their life. I mean, it's so, I mean, dealing with other people, I mean, honestly, it's so, I mean, it's such a big fun. But, so, at the end, they decided that uh, they, 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 were, they had to actually start uh, investing again. That, that they couldn't leave us to this on our own. And so, we ended up having a joint, uh, I mean, an, an, an MOU to jointly develop uh, FTTC in specific areas. So basically, they're doing it on their own in the areas where we have fiber to the home, and we're doing it together in the extra uh, footprint. But this is not the end of the story. There's another uh, element. This year, Vodafone Italia decided that they're doing it too. So you think this is the, how you trigger a race to fiber. If you make competition work, competition is the only and most powerful incentive to investment. Everything else just doesn't work. We were, by the way, at, I mean, asked, we had applied to the European Bank of Investment for financial uh, uh, backup uh, and to, to have the money. And, I mean, the only thing they asked throughout the process, over and over and over again, is, is the Italian regulator, regulator going to give access to sub and bundling? So that was the only relevant element in the discussion with the bank. 
we got the, uh, uh, the, the at the end a green light from the bank that gave us some in the financial support. I just wanted to to stress how important is the uh, maintaining the current regulatory framework to create this uh, uh, again uh, race to fiber. Thanks, Lisa. And I'm finishing the story <laughs> before being so kind. Um, now. Okay, I, I want to return to your point uh, before we open up to the floor. Um, on, on the point that I raised with my girl, you're saying that OTTs are using your network and therefore you should, I guess, be compensated if it's some mutual time. And I, I think the reason we, it sounds, sounds like a very reasonable point of view to have, but I think the reason why it provokes a lot of reactions from people are um, things like there's some very interesting white papers that don't show compounds drafted on. Um, ASQ, for example, which ties back into the continent, um, which seems to suggest that the long-term game is for the internet to be only used for uh, downloading uh, some, some basic web pages and FTP, and, and then everything else should be um, served both ways. I mean, are those misconceptions? Is that the, the strategy, or did, did, did I misunderstand where you're coming from? Please, allow me. Well, what I was referring to when I um, uh, talked about um, uh, using the ecosystem uh, was that if we are um, telecom operators and OTT players um, competing um, for the same services um, for, for, uh, for the customer, that all the regulation which is put upon us and um, makes our life harder um, should at least be, uh, uh, let's say, an OTT player cannot come along and um, not uh, comply with the security issues, with portability issues, um, and, and these issues. If, for example, I look at um, some OTT players uh, in, in our markets uh, where we have to uh, comply with portability within one day, where um, services of the OTT players are not, um, let's say, portable at all, if you look at the apps, if you want to move your app from Google to Apple, which you have bought, or if you, for example, uh, look at, um, we call it search neutrality, which we don't have. I think there are a lot of issues um, where we see that um, the OTTs, uh, because of not being regulated at all, have a lot of bargaining power, um, which they can use um, um, in the discussions with and I think that's the, the, the real issue uh, where we have to find a balance once again so that um, in an open market we can compete with one another. And uh, Goran said one, one thing with regards to um, uh, bottlenecks. I totally agree um, that there is a need for regulation in those markets um, if you only have one network. But what we've seen in the, in, in, in the last time, especially with regard to copper networks, that we have cable operators, that we have uh, LTE, mobile networks, and a lot of um, uh, competition developing. And in this respect, we really have to see um, whether the level of, uh, of regulation, which is currently in the markets, is still there. <coughs> and one thing here is, and I, I can only refer to um, the digital agenda targets which we have for 2020, and we are, um, uh, as all over Europe, missing them. Uh, the BCG studies that, that 170 billion euros are missing um, to uh, achieve the uh, European uh, agenda targets. And I think if we have the analysis of this situation, we really have to find a way how to tackle this. And um, it's, not, uh, it's definitely not a situation that we can go on and on and on like we've done in the past. Thank you. Absolutely. So, so for, on the last point first, and to pick up a question, I, I've said several times the ladder of investment doesn't reach 100 there. So I, I personally, as a, not an economist, not an operator in the sector, but as a sort of humble seeker after truth, I find the model that says if you inject enough competition, there will be more investment unfounded. So I would agree with those who say that this is not a sufficient condition for investment, but I would not agree when people say, because it's not a sufficient condition for investment, just let's stop regulating. Let's be very 
attentive to the uh, fact that there are a lot of competitive pressures. Competition is in a market, so it's an access competition. You can't just say because over the top players constitute a risk for our business model, suddenly there's enough competition. It's a different sort of competition. Specifically, the non portability of data, it's not about the non portability of an access subscription. And therefore, uh, the two things have to be looked at separately. The Commission is looking at data portability, it's an outbound strategy. We would agree with those who say that unportable data is an obstacle over time to the future consumer internet economy business model. That's not a reason for suddenly deregulating e communications access. So I think. We have, to, we have to look at it in a more savvy way and be very wary of putting labels on stuff and saying portability, data, and numbers, it's the same. It's not the same. And, and just to, to um, do you think uh, Yaron's wrong? Does he think he's wrong? Oh, I think Yaron is wonderful, especially when he becomes the chair. Um, <laughs> to, to, to be clear, I think that I would be very worried if we saw the evolution of this world towards one of genuine symbiosis between the current over the top and the e com operators. If it were really symbiosis, then I would be talking to Mr. Almunio and his colleagues and say, go after that. You know, where have they found their extra rent? But I, but I agree also that although there is, I mean, in a way, I, the point I'm making, I suppose, is that even when people say that it's an ecosystem red in tooth and claw, and, and the OTTs are trying to cobble up the telcos. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not, in fact, from a society point of view, a good thing. It might be that within that ecosystem, a degree of creative tension is a good thing. But, A, we have to look at data as a model. Eh? I think that's important. The points that our telecom colleagues were making before, security, privacy, these are key issues data retention as well. By the way, we see that with the NSA, actually all the data is retained somewhere in Utah. So the OTTs are actually doing data retention, they're not just not doing it at, at the request of the EU legislature. So you have to do that stuff, but the, the future will come, in my belief, out of the sort of stuff, the story that Lisa is, is talking about, which is investment, not just in networks, but in innovation. <coughs> and if you, if you look at the potential of innovation over networks in the data economy without any of the barriers between sectors that we've imagined to exist in the past. You free your mind to see different possibilities and the people who are making money today are looking at those possibilities and succeeding with it. So I, I would say that the, the, the hope is more companies like Google, more innovative media companies like, like me or Wood, joining up with innovative e-communications providers who could also handle everything for us. I'm concerned onto my smartphone. If I can run my home and my banking off my smartphone, yes, thank you, I will pay. In my case, I'm a bit more to do that. So I think there's, there's a lot of scope for innovation, but we, 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 we miss the story because we're trying to fix a, a wide range of really strategic problems with a little tweak about sort of access regulation. Thanks for that, uh, Robert. Uh, I'm keen to open up the floor and uh, answer all the pent up questions. Let me just see how the first go uh, at this. Uh, do we have a microphone um, running around? Okay, the back. Is there a microphone? Yes, there is one. Uh, your company, Fastweb, uh, 
Uh, if I try to uh, find uh, uh, other examples, we have some Swedish uh, municipalities based on fire, but we don't have uh, as much as uh, so many examples uh, Europe-wide uh, as to the um, uh, same case uh, by Altnet challenging the incumbents and uh, uh, pushing them uh, towards climbing up the ladder, the ladder of investment. And if we try to, uh, let's say, find out some common denominators between those companies, I would say that uh, on the one hand we have a, a strong financial support. This is the case for um, uh, both companies that I mentioned, that is to say Iliad uh, and uh, uh, Fastweb. But on the other hand we have some technological innovation with Iliad, for instance, uh, as you very well know, uh, fabricating uh, their routers, their material, and having a very light structure as far as the customer care is concerned, so they're, cut, they're cutting the cost down. And on the other hand, I, uh, I see the companies uh, like you have some innovative solutions, uh, so my question to you is uh, twofold. On the one hand, uh, I, 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 it's my first time hearing that uh, the, uh, let's say, the underground cabinets are a viable alternative towards uh, the um, uh, lack of uh, cooperation spirit by the incumbents, because uh, I think in all European jurisdictions, even for an underground cabinet, you need to obtain a permit uh, to dig, uh, you need the power, you need air condition, uh, you, need, you need access on maintenance purposes. Uh, so I would like to, to have some more uh, views, uh, some more inside information from your side as to uh, the, um, let's say, facility of uh, laying those uh, uh, popping up um, um, uh, uh, underground gardens. That's my first uh, uh, part of the question. And the second one has to do with uh, the migration path from uh, the existing uh, LLU and subloop uh, uh, based model towards uh, a full um, LLU, uh, let's say, uh, fiber to the cabinet, uh, that is to say, mixed uh, copper uh, uh, fiber model. Um, I understand that in these transition phases where uh, the, you have to maintain your revenues and you have to migrate progressively your customers uh, towards the, uh, the um, uh, fiber to the cabinet solution, you have to protect your revenues and you are heavily relying on the uh, copper pricing uh, as far as the subgroup uh, is concerned. And you are heavily relying also on some regulatory decisions uh, of um, uh, local regulators uh, as far as the access price is concerned. I would like to get your views on uh, both uh, those questions. Thank you. Very uh, On the cabinet, uh, the um, underground cabinet obviously doesn't mean that we could go ahead and build it without any permission from municipalities. It's just that it was a solution to overcome the a number of objections, especially in artistic cities like Rome, Florence, uh, and uh, other other uh, cities in Italy, in which I mean the uh, mayors and local municipalities were just worried about another uh, uh, cabinet in the streets uh, interfering with the uh, uh, with the city. So that so that was the, the, the solution, and it was actually way more complex than I'm uh, telling, obviously, because we had to find a solution to power those cabinets. Because those, I mean, Telecom Italia's, uh, are, um, the incumbent's cabinets are powered through the copper. But we found that to be not a safe, a secure solution. And so we actually installed a, 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 an independent a power um, feeder in each cabinet. So each cabinet is connected to the electric grid and it's individually powered. Uh, now we are finding even other uh, innovative solution. In other cities where we don't want to, obviously the underground cabinet has a cost, and it's not a, a small cost. In other places where we don't want to uh, uh, bear that cost, we're coming up with the funniest solution, which is we are uh, taking a picture of the environment in where the cabinet will go, and then turn that picture into a sticker, a huge sticker that goes around the cabinet, so the cabinet uh, is not really so evident. Uh, for uh, so I mean this is again uh, stuff you come up with when you uh, uh, want to uh, really want to achieve a result. I mean I know it's not obviously 
It is true, it's not the kind of uh, innovation that the internal world has uh, used us to. Obviously, uh, whatever Amazon or, or uh, uh, Google does is way more exciting than coming up with a sticker that has like red bricks or, uh, I mean, uh, uh, green plants. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. But still, I mean, this I'm trying to say that these are, uh, we are more used to to do what we call workarounds. I mean, a workaround is, our, I mean, our lifestyle. Okay, we cannot do this. Okay, well, let's try another way to actually achieve the results. And we normally, I mean, we usually, or in most cases, we've been successful. On the other, on the other issue, you're exactly right. Basically, uh, as I said, the one of the biggest misconceptions is that the NGA based on FTCC is not a sustainable investment. It's an amazingly, uh, I don't want to say cheap, because I mean, I, I, I mean I'm actually uh, probably exaggerating, but it's, it is uh, an affordable investment. Uh, obviously, especially for a company that has some, uh, some uh, uh, fiber in the ground already. Our business plan, actually, is based on partly increasing revenues by selling ultra broadband services to our customers. When I mean ultra broadband, I, by ultra broadband I mean 80 to 90 percent, uh, 80 to 90 megabit per second. This is the kind of speed we are achieving with fiber to the cabinet without vectoring currently. Okay, in order to actually, um, when we, we give this kind of speeds, we ask for a premium price. But a big part of our business plan is actually based on the saving that we achieve by migrating all customers from unbounded to sub -blue. So the differential between the two is incredibly important. I mean, I'm, what, I, what, what I want to stress is that we never went uh, to the Archcom to ask for a reduction of the amount. The current, I know that there is a case currently, uh, uh, and it's, uh, I mean, actually infamous case uh, in the uh, front, I mean, uh, that's triggered a phase two that uh, regards a, a decrease of the unbounded. But that is just a correction. It's a very minor decrease of the unbounded, and it's, uh, it was triggered by a material mistake that the previous Archcom board made back in 2009. So it has nothing to do with what we uh, call the incentive to invest. What we made very clear to the Commission and to the national regulator in the past two years that what is important is to maintain a good, I mean, space between unbundling and sub loop in order to encourage alternative operators say, okay, I want to go the extra mile. I want to go, keep go further deep in the network. I want to go closer and closer to the final customer with my fiber. And again, I think that was successful because if even both of them now that hasn't a lot of fiber, has a lot of way more money than we do, but that's another story, uh, is actually going along the same path, means that maybe we were right and it is uh, uh, the way to go. But I, I'll, I'll, I'll never stress this uh, enough. The real issue in the future will be uh, making sure that sub loop for at least a reasonable time while the investments are ongoing is kept at the price that creates a real level playing field. Because for incumbent, the price of sub loop is a nominal fee from one pocket to the other pocket. For an alternative operator, the fee, access fee to subloop is cashed out and that goes somewhere else. But obviously, what we're not so keen is actually uh, subsidizing the incumbent's investment that has already a number of advantages. But anyway, we, again, we don't like to whine, we don't like to complain. We just head down and we go ahead with our plan and uh, uh, we'll uh, be. I mean, I'm very confident that this is the approach that uh, uh, will convince, uh, I mean, eventually, Archcom to maintain the, the right incentive to, to fight the gap. Yeah, you were with me. Are you with me? I'm, I'm a little bit silent here because I actually agree with Robert or something. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just asking, I haven't understood what you've said from the last, I'm sorry, from the Commission. Things you've said there could have very much been implemented in the proposals you made recently, and I think it would be much better. I, I, there's one thing I would like to stress in this, but I want to restress it again because I can sound really critical of the, of the grid. I think that the European grids have a golden harness because 
terms of their network, their infrastructure. They're, they're actually making a lot of money for most of them. Uh, the good ones are. And, and I think they're going to use that to develop very good services for the end users. And I also think a lot of these discussions that we're having right now is very important for them as well, because it's showing that the level of knowledge in this space can actually be used for them to make new services for, for end users. I just want them to understand that in Barrick, Barrick, my peers, is very passionate um, about the industry and the end users of Europe, and we really want to help. But we're also very good friends with everybody, and sometimes good friends tell us you when you're wrong. And I think that we are, as a community in Berwick, um, we can be used even better in that sense, because we know a lot of what's happening in the market. We know about a lot about what happened on the consumer side. We do understand the business ontology, what happens with the only top players. And I think that, I think we've shown that already, and we can show that, and also so the Commission. Use this level of competence that is in this room, for the next couple of days, and I think you will see even great results. Because if we can get this together, I think there's an opportunity not only for the operators, but also for the European you know, top players, and also for the industry itself. And that would be very, very good. Thanks. You, you said something interesting. You said operators are doing, uh, making a fair amount of money, or well, at least the good ones are. I'd like to uh, ask a question. Is one of the problems that we have maybe that we should be letting more operators go down the pan if they're not good and making money? That is, should not be a discussion that should be held by me, because that, I think, is because the consumers should have that choice. But we had a net neutrality discussion in Sweden last year, and it was very intense, because some of the operators, actually one of the operators came out and said, we're going to start charging extra for a lot of services that's otherwise open. And we said that that's very interesting. We, we, you know, we wish you good luck. We wouldn't buy stock in your company, uh, because we're thinking of lose customers. And what happened was that, um, all the other operators went out and said we're not going to do anything, we're going to keep the open net neutrality as it is, and we're actually going to promote it and make it even better. So competition actually works. And I think that if if consumer, if operators just want to do good job, they should eventually be led to die. But it's not my decision, it should not be my decision, as it should not be, be my decision to say that. Because it should be, we should create an environment, which is, I think, all of my colleagues think is very, very important to make sure that the good ones really have the opportunity to do something. And there are ones that won't be as good, and they are eventually going away. That's very natural. You, you, you raise right at the end the delicate questions, so the appropriate thing would be to just be quiet and go to the bar. But, um, I think that would not be you, would it, Robert? That wouldn't be me, would it? No, but the, we're going to the bar night for the good place left. But the, the, the first thing I would say is I, I definitely agree with Europe. In a, in a world where we understand that the determinants of success for operators are not solely located within the regulatory framework, it's even more important that the people operating the regulatory framework, whether it's national governments, national regulators, or the EU institutions, don't behave as if the regulatory framework was determining life and death for operators. I think that's a very important act of humility and, and therefore it's very important that I agree with Laura on that one because we're very humble in the Commission. The, 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 the second point, however, is that um, when you say, is it, is it conceivable in this sector that operators go to the wall? This question comes in different flavours. I mean, for, for member states, including, I think, those with below average populations, let's put it that way, that issue is very much implicit in the discussion on the connected continent. Can we envisage a future where provision gets better, but maybe we don't have as many or any or a leading flag carrier in the future? I think that's a very important question, and I don't think that can be settled in Brussels, but if you look at other uh, big sectors, whether it's car manufacture or uh, aviation, and you can see that same sort of discussion where the politics and the economic efficiency arguments interact. The second point is, on that issue, if you look at the Barroso II track record of competition policy and what Mr. Amir and his advisors say, they, I think, remain of the view, which reinforces my position, that in-country consolidation might not be the next best thing. So, these are able to agree. But cross-country competition and consolidation might be a way of building more dynamic models. So that's what Mr. Arminius says 
from time to time, and I, I believe to be implicit in the logic of the Connected Continent proposal. In other words, we have to at the very least be open to a future where the, 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 the actors in the ecosystem won't be configured the way they are today. You can't have an innovative Europe with no intersectoral boundaries and data-driven economics if we keep everything the way it is today. And I think a willingness to contemplate very different futures is a, is a minimum success factor for Europe in these areas that we haven't quite grasped yet. But it's, it's more a stance than an action because no, I, don't, I don't think you could save every company you wanted to save in any sector if you wanted to. And I actually don't think you should go around in a market economy saying that, that it's indifferent to you as you CEO of the company, what its fate is. Thanks, Alan. I'll ask you again after a few, uh, few drinks and <laughs> see what the answer is. Um, uh, I'm happy to open up the floor again uh, if we have any hands waving about. Anyone now? This is, this is your chance. Um, although I know you're all keen to, to get hold of that drink. Uh, um, but uh, I'm not going to wrap up just yet. I'm just going to give uh, everyone on the panel um, a final word. Um, we'll give Robert the final, final word because I think that's my mission to, um, to get the final word. Um, but we'll run down um, Yaron and Lisa and uh, Jochen and then Robert and um, just reflections or last points that you want to clarify or whatever. I think that one of the most important discussions that we can carry on, apart from the current proposal from the Commission, uh, is the discussion about the relevant definition of the relevant markets next year. I think that. Uh, is that the end time for me? Or? I, I think that going forward um, next year is going to be essentially important because coming into that discussion, we really want to define a lot of those things we discussed here. What, what, how should we regulate to make sure the customer gets what they want and what they pay for? And those, we, historically, we've been working very much from a, from a technical oriented platform, and maybe we have to look into something different. But I'm looking forward, um, and I'm very, I'm knowing that, the, that my peers in Merrick will be having a very good discussion about it, and I hope that some members of this all will listen to us. I think it's going to be essential. Um, I, and I, I think that maybe we can have that discussion in a very open way as well, because that definition will actually set a lot more ground for what we're going to do for the next five years. Thank you. Just to pick up on uh, Sumadhe, uh, uh, I don't have anything in principle against either in country consolidation or pan European consolidation as long as it gets assessed by competition authority uh, through the standard process and, and everything else. And actually, uh, I mean, we've seen this happening, I mean, in the past 10 years. I mean, when, when liberalization was, uh, was launched in, in Italy, uh, oh God, I mean, it's a long time ago, I don't want to say that, because that's, uh, uh, but it's, it's a long time ago, there were 300 fixed operator in the market. Now there are four. I mean, it's a, it's, off, it's a natural process consolidation. What I'm worried about is that this is not the, the, the real, uh, I mean, objective of the, uh, of, of the regulation, but the real objective of the regulation, of the regulation is actually to progressively deregulate before time before it's really, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, before I mean the, 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 the time is right, and uh, uh, or to uh, pass on another, I mean, mis, I mean another wrong message, which is that the uh, virtual access services such as Google are new and modern and good and amazing, whereas the uh, physical access uh, uh, products such as subloop and bundling uh, and ULL are old and I mean come on, uh, we've done that being there uh, uh, not interesting anymore. I mean I, I, again I, I just want to emphasize once again that the innovation that we were able to bring in the market I mean was due to the fact that we had this end-to-end -end control uh, 
um, right now, I think this is it's going to be it's probably uh, uh, interesting. I told you that we are developing a parallel network, Telecom Italia and FASTA are ruling on a parallel network. Telecom Italia is offering 30 megabits. This is their ultra broadband service. We're offering up to 80. I mean, this is because we are, don't have to rely on a VULA service. Because no matter how flexible VULA is, you're never going to be able to go over the speed that are decided by the owner of the network. Simple as that. Plain as, I mean, as that. Thank you so much. Um, thanks a lot. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for inviting us here and having this um, very intense and interesting discussion. Um, and I don't really want to uh, go through all, all the issues so we, have, we have been touching during this day, but I think and it's no um, controversy or contradiction with regards to the interest of the consumers, but the consumers in the end will only get those services they deserve if the networks are available and if the investment we are still lacking is, is coming to the market. And that's our joint approach we have to take. It's, it's not um, the industry only, it's not uh, the commission only, it's not Barrett only, it's all of us to find the right solution. And uh, I think we have started into the right direction, but I think there's a lot of discussion to be done. And, um, I don't see uh, the biggest controversy with uh, the OTT players, uh, but the OTT players have to um, take their stand as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Robert, any final remarks? Maybe just, just three comments. The first is um, symmetrical precaution as you move forward. In other words, as the English say, do not throw baby out of the bathwater. And I, I, I think that, just as I said, we would be cautious about asserting that any given change has huge, uh, decisive, panacea status. Equally, we are very cautious, I think we need to be collectively as a community, when people say, the world has changed, throw away the old rules. So it's not because you don't want to review stuff and that's very that, that's really important, especially in a world that's innovating. The, the world innovates and we look to the future and we forget that a lot of the important stuff will not change. The, the second point I'd make, I think, is, is to, to reiterate, because maybe it hasn't got enough attention, a very important message which Georg Serenci put on the table in the previous panel. We need to envisage together a positive, virtuous cycle that we as a sector can get behind. I mean, if you look out, if you stand anywhere outside the sphere, the little bubble within which everybody in this room lives, it is a cacophony. It looks as if none of us really know the answer to anything, but we're desperate to stay in our jobs arguing with each other forever about it. And for politicians, and there will be new politicians in the European Parliament and in the Commission before this time next year, those issues get put aside. Too much confusion, not enough direction, too much controversy, let's find something sexier to start with. And that would be a disaster for this sector and for Europe. And that's why I think the, the Gale message, which is there is a positive future, it's relatively simple in, in, in a short version to describe how to get there, let's do it is a part of our message that we collectively owe it to the Europe's future to say more loudly, more often. If in six months' time this sector looks like the most controversial, conflicted and uncertain, nobody will help us. And the final point I wanted to make is that although I haven't been able to sit through all the discussions of the day, I think we do owe our thanks to NMHH for putting their finger on this set of issues at this stage in the European debate. It's really valuable to have this sort of discussion out of the process, because that is, in a way, part of the, the social capital that the Barrett world brings to European decision making. So I think that uh, I'm very pleased to be able to take part. But I think it it's easy to take part. What's difficult is to spot six months out that this is the discussion we need. So those would be my thoughts.
Thank you very much, uh, Robert. I, I did lie. Uh, there was one final word, so we're assuming we could have that into to close the conference. Um, but I, uh, I'm basically done here. I'd like to thank everyone who participated, all the panelists, um, the NMHH, of course, uh, and uh, wish Eric the greatest luck in, in the next few days uh, with the plenary. Intense discussions there, I'm sure, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it's been a great event. Uh, I learned a lot. I, I hope you did as well. And um, I'd like to thank everyone who was on the panel today and the NMHH for the group. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for all of you who, uh, who joined us and who participated here as a, as a participant and then speakers. Um, from our side, there is nothing as left than inviting to you for the cocktail, which will start at 7 at 6.30 in less than one hour time. Uh, in the same floor, there will be some sign outside. And uh, we really hope that we can join uh, the discussion in a much more informal way uh, a little bit later. Thank you.